Thank you, Kirby. Um, I was uh, seeing Garen talk up here. Always good to see the legislative update. And I was just thinking how much uh, I do not envy her of being in the Capitol this time of year. Uh, Garen and I used to spend a lot of time standing on the rail, uh, having a lot of similar conversations. So it's very nice to, to be out here with all of you and not have to rush back to the Capitol to deal with whatever is on tap uh, for tomorrow morning and the next couple weeks. Uh, my name is Doug Vilsack. I'm the state director for the Bureau of Land Management. I've been doing this job about two years now, and before that, spent a lot of time working on these same issues with the state. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about uh, mainly two things uh, that are occupying, I think, a lot of your time when it comes to BLM. Uh, number one, uh, the various planning processes we have going on right now, and then number two, uh, rule makings that are coming uh, to conclusion fast and furiously uh, from our headquarters. And so I guess to kick it off a little bit, I wanted to put some statistics up. Um, of course, uh, BLM uh, and production on BLM lands is still a very major, uh, a major uh, component of oil and gas development here in the state. There is still a tremendous amount uh, of activity going on on BLM uh, that provides, uh, obviously, revenue to the Treasury, uh, revenue to the states and local governments, uh, and uh, that fuel we need for a lot of what we do here in the United States. So. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for the work that you do. Um, and at the same time, I think we've spent a lot of time, and as you'll see in these planning processes and the rulemakings going on, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about uh, responsible energy development and how really we make sure uh, that we are uh, conducting these operations responsible, directing operators to be producing in locations that make sense, uh, and really trying to provide structure um, for all of you in the room in terms of uh, how to go about uh, doing work on BLM lands. Um, one thing I'd like to point out here, just kind of with, when it comes to responsible oil and gas development, uh, one thing that we are working on quite a bit these days, uh, hopefully soon with the benefit of a lot of the federal funds coming down uh, for orphan wells, um, is to really uh, kind of work through some of our orphan well challenges. I think I was very surprised when I came over from the state at the uh, seemingly low number of orphan wells that we have on BLM lands. Um, I think practically a lot of that has to do with uh, work that we need to do to actually do due diligence and understand um, what operators are still in existence or perhaps not uh, and actually do the work uh, that the state has done in their processes as well. So we're spending a lot of time these days uh, trying to work to stand up a team so we can take advantage of a lot of those federal funds coming down uh, to address some of those challenges. Um, so uh, to kick it off with our many, many resource management planning processes going on right now, uh, a major one is the Big Game Resource Management Plan Amendment. Uh, this is a statewide amendment, so it impacts all of our resource management plans around the state um, and was really the product um, of litigation but also of conversations with the state um, as some of the new wildlife rules were implemented at the state level. And so um, as we have been working through this process, uh, we are at the stage now where we're reviewing comments uh, from the draft, which we got back, I believe, on February 6th, uh, so really looking through Probably a lot of comments from many of you and other organizations interested in this process uh, and really looking through um, at the current range of alternatives in the plan. And it, it, the range was anywhere from uh, alternative B, which was really essentially trying to get consistent with the state and the 1200 series wildlife rules that were uh, finalized a couple of years ago. Um, and then through alternative D, which really uh, takes a different tact and looks at um, disturbance on the landscape as a result of oil and gas development, how that might impact big game. So we are currently in the process of looking through all those comments right now uh, and hopefully uh, getting towards uh, a final um, around the July timeframe um, and then the kind of standard consistency review protest periods that go along with that and, and finalizing by the end of 2024. So quite a bit of work has gone into this, uh, many conversations with you all. I think we're getting to a really good uh, balanced uh, point uh, where we can get consistent with the state um, and make sure that we are both allowing production but also uh, making sure that we're protecting our big game habitats. Um, birds. Uh, we have two planning processes going on uh, with, with species of uh, sage grouse these days. Uh, one that may be a little less of interest to this group, uh, the Gunnison sage grouse planning process, uh, which uh, is basically responding uh, to the listing of the Gunnison sage grouse, I believe it was 2014, um, and then a recovery plan that was put together by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so uh, a large percentage of the Gunnison sage grouse's habitat is on BLM down in the Gunnison Basin and through various satellite populations in southwestern Colorado uh, and southeastern Utah. And so we are working through on a similar time frame to the big game RMPA, uh, a process to really uh, address uh, the threatened nature of that species and how we interact with that species on BLM land. So similar uh, timeline, expect a final 
uh, to be published somewhere around uh, early July. Um, I think that is a good segue, I think, into the greater SageRouse conversation, which I know many of you have been involved with for a decade or more, uh, round three uh, for greater SageGrouse. Um, although I think the Gunnison SageGrouse conversation is a good one to lead into to greater, because obviously greater is not listed, uh, and we are trying to, uh, with these actions, uh, prevent any further uh, population declines uh, from greater sage grouse, so we don't get into a situation where we're having to take further steps like we are uh, with Gunnison and sage grouse when it's listed. Um, this one is hot off the presses. Uh, I believe it was the draft was released a couple weeks ago. There's actually a public meeting in uh, Craig tonight and a number of virtual uh, public meetings as well. Um, I will say for this one, um, as I've heard from uh, many of our folks in this room as well, um, we did a pretty good job in past planning processes, and so hopefully a lot of what's in the preferred alternative in this one um, and in the other alternatives are things that folks have seen before. Um, so I think I'm, I'm pretty happy with where this ended up in terms of uh, taking into account the past work uh, that we've all done uh, when it comes to greater sage grouse and greater sage grouse planning. Many other planning efforts, uh, one that is done, uh, and I will say this is a theme, uh, one of my goals, I think I said last year as, we, as I started uh, down the road of being the state director, is to really try to land these planning processes and land them in a way um, that is balanced uh, so that we can be done and move on and get implementing. And I think for our staff members here, um, everybody on my staff uh, are very excited to get away from litigation, to get away from kind of planning processes themselves and get back to actually doing work on the ground uh, and trying to work on these issues uh, with species or just the general day-to-day -day management that you do when you have an active resource management plan. So the Eastern Colorado RMP, uh, we are very excited uh, to get the rod done on that in January. Um, I think it landed very well. I think we got some good response from a number of you in this room, um, I think from all sides of that planning process saying that uh, we really hit the mark on that one in terms of balanced approach. Um, I think part of the reason for that is that we spent so much time really going around over the nine or 10 years during that process, talking to local governments, talking to local stakeholders, um, and really understanding what their concerns are, what they wanted to see in their areas. And so uh, that approach of kind of breaking that Eastern Colorado RMP, which is huge, almost the entire Eastern side of Colorado, uh, into four areas and really having those conversations uh, locally, I think got us to a good point in the end where uh, we've just received general praise, I think, on that plan. Um, we hope to build uh, on the success of that plan and a lot of those conversations uh, in others that are ongoing right now. I think as some of you know, uh, we have a plan that impacts Colorado River Valley Field Office uh, and uh, Grand Junction Field Office, uh, the oil and gas decisions in those field offices that's going on right now, uh, right in this area. Um, we are uh, nearing uh, the final EIS uh, stage, uh, publishing the final EIS in that one as well. And I think similarly uh, has spent a lot of time working with folks, uh, really getting down into the details, understanding those areas um, that may need additional protection or that have a lot of significance for folks uh, that live in these areas or for the tribes. And then at the same time, really thinking about uh, where are areas of high potential oil and gas, uh, where do we really want to focus a lot of that development um, in these two field offices. Um, and again, You'll have to let me know when the final is published, but I think we're really getting to a point where we're finding that balance, protecting some very important areas and at the same time uh, keeping some good lands open uh, for production. Um, and then similarly, um, trying to take that approach into the Uncompagre uh, RMP, which is back open again. Uh, we just finished uh, scoping on that one um, and are really sitting down and kind of looking at the range of alternatives for Uncompagre. So this is kind of the Delta Montrose uh, just north of our southwest or north part of our southwest district area. Um, so that one's a little further out. Uh, we don't plan to get a draft out on that one until the until close to the end of the year. Um, but our staff down the field office is working quite a bit. And then lastly, uh, we are also working on a really west-wide uh, solar plan, um, looking at updating the 2012 uh, programmatic environmental impact statement um, that designated a number of solar energy, energy zones around the west. Um, so that one, I think the public comment closes on that one in the next couple days this week. Um, and I know we're starting to see some comments filter in. Um, a very critical plan for us to get done. Obviously, a lot of interest in solar energy development these days. Uh, Colorado uh, is in, in an interesting spot when it comes to uh, solar availability on BLM. Uh, right now, uh, putting aside uh, this plan, about 2% or less of BLM lands in Colorado are currently open at an RMP level uh, for 
solar development. Um, those are solar energy zones down in the San Luis Valley. Um, and this plan is really looking at um, a number of factors to try to try to hone in on where other other areas where uh, solar might be appropriate. So just to give you some sense of kind of the scope of that, um, I believe the preferred alternative uh, would change to about 7% uh, of BLM land would be open to solar for development. But um, we will see what we get in terms of public comments and then obviously spend quite a bit of time thinking about what the final uh, will be on that plan. Uh, Thompson Divide withdrawal. Uh, I know many folks have been involved with this uh, for years. Um, we kicked off the segregation process, gosh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, when the president uh, was here, Secretary Holland kicked off the process. Uh, and as I think many of you know, uh, that process culminated a couple weeks ago in the final withdrawal by uh, Secretary Holland. Um, that withdrawal ended up encompassing a little under, I think, 225,000 acres, um, stretching all the way from the Carbondale area in Garfield County um, over the Thompson Divide uh, and down to Crested Butte. So obviously a lot of work has gone into that uh, process for many, many years. And I think, again, getting back to um, that reasonable or responsible energy development, um, I think the secretary looking at this, the determination was that you know Thompson is a very important area, both for wildlife, agriculture, and many other uses, and that it was appropriate uh, to continue or move forward with this 20-year withdrawal. So that just wrapped up a couple weeks ago. Um, hot off the presses, I had to change this presentation a couple times, uh, I think, uh, as I sent it to Kirby, just because so much is going on these days uh, when it comes to rulemaking at the federal level. Um, the onshore oil and gas rule, or, or, or the onshore oil and gas leasing rule uh, being one of those, I know many participated um, in that process, um, really uh, sits down, um, this one, this one seems a little off. I think my slide might have been a little, little messed up. What does this say here? Specs are finalized in the near future. I think this is my old slide, slide deck. Uh, this was finalized last Friday. Um, so this rule uh, really takes a look at, um, takes a look at bonding um, and updates bonding uh, on federal lands. Um, it has been uh, updated, uh, hasn't been updated in over 60 years, and so it basically changes the standard uh, bonding rates that we've had on BLM lands for many, many years. Um, again, that was finalized last Friday. Um, and then lastly, um, the public lands rule. Uh, I've had many conversations with, with some of you about the public lands rule. Um, this one I would expect to come in the near future. Um, I think at this meeting last year, the draft had just come out, so we, we had quite a bit of conversations around the public lands rule and, and where it might go in the future. Um, I would expect, again, I, I haven't seen the final final. Um, I expect it will come in the near future, but some of those concerns I know that have been expressed uh, will be addressed in the final, uh, particularly a lot of concerns around uh, conservation leasing or what was called conservation leasing, leasing in that role, um, concerns that uh, the tool could be used kind of more as a, a designation type tool. Um, and I believe in the final, uh, what you'll see is, is more of a kind of two-pronged approach uh, to that tool. On one hand, uh, a tool that will allow uh, mitigation projects to occur on BLM land. So for example, mitigation projects that might uh, come as a result of uh, uh, mitigation requirements uh, through ECMC. Um, and on the other hand, uh, a restoration lease, um, which will require uh, somebody to come in and actually do active restoration. Um, not, I think, as uh, many were concerned um, just a line on a map drawn around something and, and not allowing anything to happen there, really more a tool uh, to allow us to get folks uh, that can do stream restoration, other activities like that, uh, kind of a toehold on BLM land to allow them to do that work. So that uh, is what I had in the presentation, but happy to answer any questions uh, folks have. Um, again, we have a tremendous amount going on, and I guess I will just say in closing, uh, thank you for all of uh, the time you have spent of responding to our rule makings and to uh, our plans. Um, I think in the end, we will, we will reach some really balanced uh, final plans and rules that will provide opportunities both for uh, oil and gas development, uh, but also for uh, some of the protection and the work that we do with wildlife um, and lands. So, questions? I'm oh, you. Oh, <laughs> up. When do you think we could see 
leasing opportunities, specifically in Western Colorado. I think there's been one lease sale in this administration in Weld County, but outside of that, we've seen none in Colorado. Do you see that changing in this fiscal year or, or what, what are your thoughts around that? I wouldn't say in this fiscal year because again, like we're not gonna have, for example, the, the Colorado River Valley Grand Junction RMP done done at, at rod stage until the fall. Um, and so, you know, similarly, I think with the, with the Eastern Colorado RMP, um, that finalized in January. And again, it's a very small lease sale, but we immediately turned around and at least one parcel kind of started the lease sale process again there. So um, you will start seeing some of that um, uh, very swiftly um, after we finalize some of these plans. Um, so. There you are. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, uh, my group bought uh, some leases in 2019, the summer sale there in 2019, Northwest Colorado, and uh, they were never issued. Uh, obviously, the royalty range are apparently going to change on us from what was agreed to at the lease sale. I'm just curious, is there any hope that we'll ever get our lease, or what's, what's going to happen? I might have to follow up you directly on that one. Uh, where are you in Northwest uh, Colorado? Uh, that was actually uh, Western Route County, Northwest Route County. Okay, uh, well, we can follow up with our uh with our field office up there and, and circle back on that one. Okay, thanks. Grab me after this, happy to, and happy to anybody else if they just wanna grab me after this too, we can talk about more specific issues. Director, um, quick question for you. How, can you give us an update on the big game uh, RMP process and when you expect to see that one completed? Sure, um, I talked about that for a minute there, uh, but uh, we should see the, the final, um, you know, in advance of the standard protest period and consistency review period. Uh, likely in early July. Um, so we are moving moving pretty fast to finalize that one right now. Uh, Director Wendell Coons, Delta County, we just submitted comments for this solar PEIS. Mm -hmm. And I know it wasn't in the alternatives or in the scoping, but one of the things Delta County would like to see is uh, policies from the BLM that would support uh, acreage rentals, royalties, uh, something commensurate to what oil and gas, uh, coal and others pay for uh, use in, of BLM lands, public lands. Uh, is there talk in DC or in the office or at state level for any of that? There is not um, at the state and federal, well, at the kind of BLM level. Um, and I would have to go back and look at this. My understanding is that, that there is, is talk um, kind of at the congressional level about that because I believe that's a little bit more of a congressional decision in terms of determining, and I assume you're talking about, uh, you know, funding that could flow to local governments like Delta County. Yeah. Um, so I believe uh, I was just asked by one of the commissioners in Chaffee County about that the other day, and they sent me a, a bill that's pending in Congress on that issue. So I think it's a little more of a congressional issue than a kind of something we could address uh, via rule. Hi. Um, I'm curious about the BLM waste rule, and yes. <laughs> um, if there's lots of questions. This is pretty impactful. Um, we're just curious if there's going to be sort of a Q&A session or some guidance documents. Um, we're speaking from the Southern Indian tribe. We're, we're pretty surprised on some of those things that came through in the rule. Yeah, and I, I, was, I was surprised when I looked at my presentation because that was one of the things I actually added. Uh, so I didn't talk about the waste prevention rule. Um, so that is out. Um, there is a lot of good uh, kind of guidance, I think, online right now, and I can get that to you uh, if you give me your card. Um, and I think there are plans to do some additional um, kind of outreach um, to folks around uh, the requirements of that rule. Um, and I know at least some of the pieces of that, um, just because we have quite a bit uh, quite a bit of activity around uh, waste prevention here in the state. Um, a lot of other state actors or folks uh, drilling in the state are kind of aware of some of that work, but happy to get you a little more guidance and then follow up with uh, any additional outreach that will be done from headquarters. Director, hi, my name is Jason Swerer. I'm with uh, Geothermal Rising. And I was wondering if you could speak to the announcement that you guys made yesterday with regard to the federal level categorical exclusions for geothermal permitting and how you might believe that this is better than statutory certainty in that regard. Um, I saw that announcement. I'm, I'm probably not the, the biggest expert on a geothermal permitting here in the state. Um, we have been spending a lot of time talking about how uh, 
or what uh, geo geothermal development might look like uh, here in the state of Colorado. Obviously, uh, there's an initiative uh, at the state level, a lot of interest uh, from the state on geothermal uh, work, and so we're really trying to feel it out here in the state. I think we have one existing geothermal lease uh, right now down in Gunnison County, um, and so uh, are really just trying to think as we look at, for example, workforce planning uh, to try to think about um, how we have expertise and understanding uh, when some of those applications start coming in. So not a tremendous amount of detail for you, but if, again, if you give me your card, um, I can connect you with the folks um, in our division that work on geothermal. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I haven't talked about that too much recently, uh, but of course, all over the West, um, there is a history of uh, uranium mining, uh, kind of various mining on BLM lands. I think um, when it comes to uranium, it's always been an ebb and flow uh, in terms of what those prices are looking like. So um, yeah, uh, we kind of have a history, certainly uh, here in Colorado, uh, of some of that ac activity, not quite as much um, in the recent past. So. Um, really has been something that our minerals division has worked on for, for years, but again, haven't seen quite as much activity as we have had, have had in the past. Anyone else? Last chance? All right. Thanks for having All me. All right. Big hand for Director Gilsat.